the shaman displays his possession by a spirit by publicly reenacting his specific personal experience, that of a man suffering from a particular mental affliction. His projections, his hallucinations, his journey through space and time thus became a dramatic ritual and served as the prototype for all future concepts of the religious road of perfection. And this was the recognition in the 30s and 40s that what shamanism is about is a very controlled, very socially contextual version of metamagical schizotypalism. The word did not exist in the field at the time, but that is what it is. It is not normally considered a sign of robust mental health to hear voices coming out of burning bushes. This is considered a worrisome sign. This is considered diagnostic. It is not a good thing to be reporting that you just spent the night wrestling an angel. It is usually a very disturbing sign if you were reporting you've had a conversation with someone who is dead and has risen from the grave. These are diagnosable problems in our secular Western realm. These are the backbones of our belief systems, we in the West as well as we humans in non-Westernized settings. Schizotypalism runs through all of human history. What you wind up having then is this obvious question, who invented this stuff? Who came up with the notion that the world was invented in seven days, or snakes with apples are up to something no good, or it's possible to give birth and you're still a virgin. These were not designed by committees. These were designed by extremely formative, extremely influential schizotypals throughout history. What the new studies are now beginning to show is mild tendency towards increased dopamine tone, mild tendency towards most of the biology we heard about. What we're seeing is totally artificial bucket to say schizophrenia up to here, past the side, non-schizophrenic, we have this in-between zone, like everything else we've been thinking about, it's on a continuum. You look throughout the history of religious leaders, those who have invented some of the theology, and we will come to different variants of religious leaders shortly, as you see those who invented the theology, that there is very often a thread of metamagical thinking that goes through this. And this is metamagical thinking of a type that falls readily into the spectrum of schizotypalism. Here's one of the amazing examples of ritualism. Okay, these numbers have magical powers in Orthodox Judaism. And you will note 365 is the number of days in the year. 248 is the number of bones that people believed were in the bodies during the Middle Ages when this evolved. And together, 613, according to the holy books, there are 613 rules for daily behaviors. 365 prohibitions every day, 248 things that have to be done every day. The preponderance of the prohibitions leading one clearly fairly depressive rabbi back when to be saying, Obviously, it would have been better if none of us were born, given the fact that there were more things that we could mess up by doing. But what you see here is, this is highly ritualistic, the number of prohibitions equaling the number of days of the year, the number of ritual constraints equaling the number of bones in the body, 613 is the magic number. Okay, where did these numbers come from? Very often in religious rituals, what you find is a number has symbolic value because it's got a certain appeal for making learning easier. It is not by chance that a base 10 society came up with 10 commandments. God, the number of things God doesn't want us to do each day is equal to the number of days of the year. The number of things God wants us to do is equal to the number of bones in the body. Okay, great device for remembering the rules. But here's the amazing thing, nobody knows the rules. You look through thousands of pages of commentary stretching back centuries and the rules aren't written down and various rabbis have made a living arguing over what are the 365 things you aren't supposed to do each day. In other words, the numbers are more important than the content. The content is less critical than the fact that whatever they are, there's 365 things that God doesn't want you to do. And whatever they are, there's 248 that God wants you to do. The number that you are attributing to God is more important in that case than the content. Okay, classic, classic obsessive numerology. 
And probably for most of you by now, what will be the most familiar is looking at Orthodox Christianity. And you have rosaries and the counting of rosaries. You have three as a magic number. You have very detailed numbers of times you are supposed to say prayers. You have rules for entering and leaving churches. Even in Christian groups that are viewed as some of the least ritualistic, some of the most cerebral in some ways, you look at the Lutherans. Lutherans have set rules for prayers that are only said during even years, prayers that are only said during odd years. All of these versions of orthodoxy are absolutely shot through with rituals built around cleansing of the body, food preparation, entering and leaving of significant places, and numerology. It's the exact same list as you find with OCD. I suspect in periods of religious crisis, cultural crisis, during a period of persecution, during a period where whatever is currently in shape is not working, the right person at the right moment comes forward and in effect says, this is how I have been private honoring our Lord all these years, and I am offering it to all of you to see this is what I have been doing, and in the right place and time, it catches on and it turns into the thing that is the ritual for the rest of the community within decades. These ideas go back decades, go back centuries, that there is a parallelism between the symptoms of what we call schizotypalism and the metamagical backbone of religious theology. There is a parallelism between what we call obsessive compulsive disorder and the ritualism of mainstream orthodox religion and this key point that the exact same behaviors which in one context destroys your life has you peripheralized, do it right, do it in the right context and it is not peripheralizing, it makes you very honored and powerful. I am not saying, ooh, some snotty, you gotta be crazy to be religious. That's nonsense. Nor am I saying even that most people who are, are psychiatrically suspect. I'm not saying that in the slightest. What I'm saying is, it is absolutely fascinating that the same exact traits, which in a secular context, are life-destroying, separate you from a community, and in the right setting, are at the very core of what is protected, what is sanctioned, what is rewarded, what is valued in religious settings so often, and that there could be an underlying biology to this, and what do we do with this?